So our speaker tonight is Dr. Lindsay Goodall. So Dr. Lindsay Goodall is an equine veterinarian and works in the Department of Animal Science at Cornell University. She teaches courses in equine biology and management, domestic mammalian behavior and animal welfare science. She is also Cornell Cooperative Extension's equine specialist, where she serves as a resource for New York's extension educators, horse owners, and industry professionals. So we are very happy to have um, Lindsay with us tonight to be presenting on equine metabolic diseases and common pitfalls when feeding horses. Thank you, Abby. Hi, everyone. Uh, like she said, I'm uh, Lindsay Goodale. I'm over at Cornell right now, which is actually also where I went to vet school. And um, because I'm just repeating that <laughs> to clarify that um, because I am a veterinarian and not, you know, I'm not a, an equine nutritionist, I don't have a PhD in nutrition, my focus will be a lot on, you know, what kind of issues do we run into that are associated with um, eating, feeding, you know, nutrition in general, um, a bit kind of from the perspective of a veterinarian. So maybe a bit different than a, um, someone, a talk that someone, you know, an equine PhD in nutrition might give. So I'm also, oh, okay, I'll switch it again. <laughs> it's switched, Abby. Does that look more normal? <laughs> we tried it and it switched on us. Okay, there we go. So, um, and I also wanted to say, this is kind of a nice size group to have a little discussion and or uh, feel free to stop uh, to ask questions. If you type something in the chat, I think my fellow CCE um, folks will be kind of monitoring that and they'll let me know if there's mass confusion or if someone has a question. So we'll happy to stop and answer that. So um, a couple uh, kind of as an intro, I think a lot of times, um, especially maybe if you're taking the time to watch an equine nutrition webinar during the evening when it's nice out, <laughs> you probably care about equine nutrition, I'm hoping. And so um, I, rather than go over all the normals, like what percent body weight, hey, do we feed and all that kind of stuff, I thought I'd jump right into what kind of issues do we run into when we're feeding horses. Um, I'll start off with the one I, at least I hear about most often, um, and was certainly a big problem that came up clinically when I was a vet, um, easy keepers. This is a classic photo, <laughs> an easy keeper, right? Um, you know, we could be talking about obesity. Um, and then we're also, of course, not just worried because they're fat or maybe, um, you know, can't fit into last season's blanket or whatever. It's because of the associated problems that come along with it, like equine metabolic syndrome, laminitis, et cetera. That's why we're actually worried, right? And so that's honestly what I'll be focusing on. Okay, it looks like someone's having an issue with audio, so hopefully they can resolve that. Let us know if anyone else is having trouble. Um, and so that's what I'll be focusing on a lot because honestly, it's what I see the most of and or hear the most um, in terms of people struggling to deal with it, right? And so we'll talk about that uh, quite a bit. And then uh, of course, the, the other end of the spectrum also causes people a lot of heartache as well, right? So hard keepers, um, AKA a skinny horse, it's hard to keep weight on them. Um, you, you worry about underfeeding, of course, but you have to worry about about both pieces of that, right? So you can underfeed total energy, which of course makes them thin, um, but you can also uh, accidentally underfeed nutrients. So maybe they're getting enough energy and their body condition is actually good, um, but it's a little more uh, insidious. Uh, if you're underfeeding nutrients, you can't necessarily tell until it gets a bit far. And now you're, uh, you're like, why is my horse having these issues? Perhaps you're underfeeding nutrients. So it's Good to think, of course, about the total energy you're feeding, but then also the actual nutrients themselves. And it sounds like, uh, Karen, you're unmuted, <laughs> just FYI. <laughs> um, and then a big, uh, surprisingly, I get a lot of questions on this and I always send them the UC Davis uh, refeeding protocol. But when you do have a really skinny horse, I think maybe a lot of rescues are worried about this there is a right and a wrong way to refeed them. And you have to be very careful. Um, some of you may have heard of refeeding syndrome. And so um, that's definitely a resource I can point people towards if they're interested. Uh, and then, I mean, 
it's hard to go to an equine talk of any kind really without gastric ulcers coming up probably, right? So I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it. Um, they're unfortunately quite widespread. Um, and uh, hopefully uh, you've at least heard of the idea that this is a problem and I'll mention those uh, towards the end as well. Uh, this, I would say, compared to, let's say, 10 years ago, I've heard the phrase hindgut imbalance a lot more than I used to. Um, it's, it's not that it's a new problem. I think people are just uh, maybe thinking about these issues a little bit more, the microbial population in a horse's gut. And so I can bring that up a little bit, um, although there's not a ton of research on it. Uh, carb overload can be a problem both kind of chronically, but then also just uh, acutely. So, you know, a horse getting into the grain room. Again, I think we all kind of see that as a big issue, right? Um, another common thing people ask about equine nutrition is, can I make my horse too hot? by feeding him certain foods. And they're mostly, of course, worried about reactivity, which especially if you're riding the horse is an obvious safety concern, or even if you're handling them really, right? Um, so we'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. I had to include this picture because i that's what I think of when I think of hot horses. Um, and then maybe some controversial areas, uh, maybe that's a little strong of a term, but um, you know, uh, things to which there's not necessarily a right answer, I guess you could say. So we'll talk a little bit about how to decide whether to use hay nets, what size, is it the right choice for my horse, and then uh, versus ground feeding, for example, square versus round bales, lots of pros and cons on both sides, right? And then um, I don't know if we'll get to this because this is a lot, right? Um, and it's okay if we don't get through everything. I'm happy to chat with people if they have questions, but uh, supplements is <laughs> the bane of everyone's existence probably, right? Should I feed them? When? How do I decide? All that. So this is, uh, uh, these are a few things we'll touch on. I'll really, to be honest, be focusing mostly on easy keepers or obesity, EMS, all that stuff, because uh, it's what I get asked about the most. So I figured I'd address that a little bit here. And so to back up a little bit, it's funny, the actually one of the most common questions I get asked are, why are all the horses fat now? What's happening? <laughs> Why are there more fat horses? Um, it's a little hard to answer this. Um, to define it, obesity in horses is actually considered just uh, above a certain body condition score. So do they have X amount of fat over their, the other, other tissues? This is actually out of five. We also often use a BCS score out of nine, right? And I'll talk a bit more about that later, but um, four out of five, uh, anything four or greater um, can be considered obesity. And this does vary by study. Um, and then of course your concern level might crop up a little sooner in a horse with a history, right? But um, in general, there's also no seasonal variation here. So it's not like they fatten up in the summer and then they get better in the winter. This is a, an obese horse stays at a very high body condition score. There have been a few surveys to try to determine, like, what are we talking about? How many fat horses do we have? Is it changing? Um, the range from these surveys is incredibly wide, so it's hard to get a good picture. This one study said 2 to 72% of horses are overweight, which is not helpful because <laughs> that doesn't give us much of a window. And then uh, the same surveys were saying maybe 1 to about 20% are actually obese, so not just overweight, but obese. Um, so greater than four out of five DCS. So, um, of course, as we all know, that does actually vary by country, it turns out. And then obviously their use or they leisure horses competition, what's the season, et cetera. Right. So, um, the, the other elephant in the room, no pun intended, but, uh, is that unfortunately, it turns out there have been studies that show that horse owners generally underestimate the body condition score of their horses. Um, so, you know, uh, a, a body only a mother could love, I guess you could say, but they uh, tend to think that their horse is a, at a healthy body condition when in fact they might be overweight. And so that's something to keep in mind. If it's your own horse, you might have rose colored glasses on. Um, and if you're, it's not your own horse, you know, having a talk with the owner, maybe about doing a more objective assessment of their body condition score. 
There's not a lot of data to support this idea of easy keepers, although we all know that you can give the same diet to one horse and another, and it doesn't seem to end up <laughs> causing the same body condition, right? It's just that there's not a lot of research on it. It's not to say it doesn't exist. Um, one kind of alternative theory that might kind of explain some of this difference is that some breeds might have enhanced metabolic efficiency. So it's like the friend you have who just eats like two Snickers for lunch and like a Coke and they're um, 90 pounds soaking wet, right? It's a little hard. They just have increased uh, metabolic efficiency. Maybe there might be a bit of a similar thing going on between some breeds. Um, and then there was an interesting study a little while ago in 2011 they fed the same diet corrected for uh, the size of the horse, obviously, um, to Icelandic horses and standard breads. And on the exact same diet, the Icelandic horses gained weight and the standard breads lost weight. So that's a little bit of evidence to support this idea that there could be differences in metabolic efficiency between some breeds. Um, so there's not a ton of research in this area, but there is a little bit. And so it probably is uh, a real thing that's happening. And so a little bit of the clue as to whether your horse might be an easy keeper, you can look at the breed to start with at least. And then I think, again, if you're here, you're probably agreeing um, that yes, equine obesity is a problem. If not, uh, you know, worldwide, at least uh, it's a problem for the individual horse who is obese, right? And um, unfortunately, there are a few pretty bad things linked to obesity in horses. So a bunch of metabolic pathologies that we'll talk about uh, soon here um, that can really affect a horse's well-being and ultimately, you know, can be fatal if they're not treated. Um, associated with a bunch of those, uh, so we have equine metabolic syndrome or EMS. Insulin resistance is often a piece of that. Um, you can definitely have, uh, you might have heard about this in other species too, even humans, the fat itself can start acting as a, kind of an organ that produces its own endocrine um, signals. And so that can start altering their kind of body-wide uh, signaling, which can have a lot of downstream effects. Um, uh, when they have a lot of fat, like quite a bit of fat, um, that can also cause low-grade body-wide inflammation. And, and then, of course, the one we're all scared of uh, is laminitis, so rotating of the the distal uh, phalange, right? P3 um, rotating and sinking, which can, of course, if it's bad enough, it causes cause lameness. And if it's really bad, it can cause, um, you know, it can require euthanasia. So it's, it's, uh, it can be scary, right? To have to deal with a, an obese horse because uh, once you realize the kind of risk factors um, that are coming into play, it can, it can get a little scary to deal with, right? And so always involve your vet. And they're there to help you. Or, we are here to help you. Um, and then of course, uh, there's a bunch of other stuff. So it's not just metabolic pathologies, but if you have some kind of performance horse, um, for example, it's been shown that uh, if a horse is racing, they'll have decreased performance if they have higher body condition score. Um, there are for sure reproductive disruptions. There have been quite a few studies on this now, and it's pretty well established that um, for example, obese brood mares or even overweight brood mares um, have less um, uh, pregnancies per insemination. So uh, yeah, it's, it can affect not just their health, but kind of their performance or the reason you're using them. And so this is, these are a few other reasons to kind of think of. Um, and it turns out that uh, in really obese mares, it, it can be altered, their reproductive performance can be altered to the degree that you actually have reduced or even absent anestrus. So they'll keep cycling through part of this, the uh, winter, which can uh, create a lot of difficulty when you're later monitoring their cycles. It can create strange cycles. Um, and in general, the take home is there can be a bit harder to breed and or to keep a pregnancy in. So. I hopefully, I think we're all agreeing at this point, yes, equine obesity is a problem. So then you might be wondering, okay, yeah, we, we know what it is. We do think it's a problem. Then the natural question, of course, is, well, okay, why are they getting fat? Um, as some of you may know, horses as a species evolved a long time ago, over millions of years, um, on kind of an environment similar to this, more or less. Um, so it was kind of the Eurasian steppes. It was like a flat, arid, um, 
plains kind of where there was low energy forage, kind of low quality forage, but it was widely available, right? So they could graze all day um, or as much as they wanted anyways, but they had to eat quite a bit because none of it was super high in energy, right? And of course there was a, this is like a, when it's looking good. And then of course there was a winter there as well, right? So there was a lot of fluctuation, but at the end of the day, they could more or less graze whenever they wanted, but they had to graze quite a bit because none of it was super high in energy. Now though, um, we ask them to do stuff, right? So we, uh, for example, might ask them to event and ride them and uh, you know do a lot of high energy required training. Um, and this of course is a bit, requires a, a bit more energy than this does, right? And so, by necessity, kind of, if we're asking them to do these things, we need to provide this additional energy somehow. And the, the main answer we've settled on is uh, to give them concentrates, right? And so it's kind of like we have a situation and we created a, a solution for it. Unfortunately, the solution has a lot of side effects because horses weren't necessarily evolved to eat diets like this sounds like one person still unmuted if you could mute yourself and then for example one of the problems we can see is uh stereotypies are increased in horses fed high uh, concentrate diets so a lot of really rich energy dense food and discrete meals um, can affect not only their kind of physiology, their gut health, but also their behavior, their mental well-being, etc. So we have to kind of learn how to uh, walk the line between how they've evolved and then what we're asking them to do now. How do we balance these two things? Because maybe you don't want to stop eventing or barrel racing or whatever it is, um, but you want your horse to be healthy. And so that's, it's kind of a mixing those ideas. And I think for me, what helped understand, uh, helped me understand a lot of this has been um, learning about behavior. I mean, I'm a little biased. That's kind of uh, equine behavior and welfare is like what I'm interested in. But for me anyways, I think it's helped quite a bit um, to learn a lot about just like uh, uh, what influences how a horse eats um, or really why it does anything, right? Um, the answer is usually food anyways, right? But there are a lot of different influences on feed intake. Some are really obvious um, and some, especially for newer horse owners. So um, maybe you have like younger members at your, your farm that you're teaching and you can kind of point these things out to them. Um, for, for example, there are of course a lot of social factors, right? Um, in terms of what, why a horse eats, when it eats, what it eats, all of that. Um, so in horses that are housed together, the size of the group has an incredibly huge impact on how much they're eating. Um, so if the, if the pasture they're in is large enough, there's not much of a problem because if a horse is kind of low in the social order, it's okay. It, it's, it won't get chased off of good grazing areas, but if it's a bit tight, the stocking density is a little high, um, then the kind of the tighter it is, the less opportunity that low ranked horse will have to eat uh, well, eat it all really, right? Any kind of resource they'll be blocked from, including water actually. So you have to be careful with how much, um, how many sta water stations you have out if there's a, a large group. Um, as I said, the, their rank within the group, there are always more desirable locations in any given pasture. And uh, for example, if you put, you know, you go dump a, a big, you know, whatever, a few square rails over the, the side of the fence or in a corner, um, if it's able to be kind of guarded by some higher ranking horses, then in general, the lower ranking horses won't get access to that. And so um, you do have to be careful with where you space feed stations out. And this can be, this is one con actually for round bales. They're so big that it can't, it's not as much of a problem unless it's a um, really big herd with just one round bale. But sometimes uh, you've probably all seen this, a lower ranked horse can get kind of pushed away from if there's just one feeding area. So increasing feeding areas and spacing them out can help quite a bit. Um, I mean, of course, seasons affects their intake a bit, right? Um, when there is an increase in food availability, so like spring, summer, um, at least in the Northeast where we are, um, that really drives them to increase their intake so that they can increase their body fat stores so that they can, of course, last through winter. 
the thing is, you know, we can't tell their body, don't worry, we're actually going to feed you plenty in the winter. And so they have uh, quite a strong drive to stock up anyways. And so that's something we have to deal with a little bit in domesticated horses. And then of course, as with us, as with any animal, it's just how much energy are they expending, right? So if they're lactating, obviously they need more energy if they're exercising, et cetera. Um, and then a big, a big thing that, to be honest, I didn't know much about until I, well, actually until I went to vet school, I think, but um, I hadn't thought a lot uh, before then about how an average horse just kind of spends its day, its 24 hours, if left to its own devices, kind of, right? Um, most horses, when given the opportunity, will spend most of the day grazing, um, this was a cool study uh, in which they looked at free range horses. This darker area is grazing. This is over 24 hours. It's averaged for a, a bunch of horses over 24 hours. They spent most of their time grazing. The rest is, you know, resting, standing, lying, whatever. When they're stabled, we're affecting that uh, quite a bit. You'll see that we're probably then offering them uh, some kind of concentrate, right? So they can get all the energy they need. They just aren't eating as much or spending as much time eating, right? So they spend uh, not nearly as much time eating. And then, you know, maybe they're being ridden or something. And then the rest of the time, they're kind of poking around. They might rest, lie down, right? There's not much else to do because this is this top one is how they've evolved to behave essentially, right? And so when left to their own devices, this is kind of how horses want to spend their time and how they've evolved to spend their time. And then again, it, if you just leave some horses out in a pasture in the back 40, whatever, um, they'll generally uh, peak in foraging kind of early morning and then late afternoon. So that's considered diurnal. Um, that can be helpful to know uh, in certain circumstances if you want to influence their feeding. And then obviously, you know, they're domestic. We're influencing what they're, they're feeding quite a bit, right? Um, talked a little bit about this already. When we give them concentrates, it's kind of more discrete feeding times as opposed to grazing throughout the day. So that can cause some GI health problems that we have to address. Um, and then as some people uh, argue against hay nets or raised feeders just for the reason that they alter the horse's natural grazing posture. There's not been a ton of research in this area to say whether that's um, necessarily a big deal, uh, but it's something that some people worry about, so um, maybe worth mentioning. And then in terms of when I think about uh, how do horses eat or how do they want to eat or spend their time kind of, I like to think about uh, one of my favorite places on earth, <laughs> um, the Havemeyer Equine Behavior Research Lab. So this is at the New Bolton Center, which is part of UPenn's vet school. This is a semi-feral pony herd. It's run by Sue McDonald, who some of you may know, or she teaches some equine behavior classes you might've taken. Um, not too far of a drive from here, if anyone's interested. But she has a decent size, this is most of them, herd of uh, semi-feral ponies. So semi-feral meaning they, they are technically enclosed. This is at the edge of one of the um, areas where they're enclosed, but it's an incredibly large area that they're enclosed in. And for in general, they don't really interact with people much. Um, so this is how they eat. Uh, <laughs> They we the technically they put out a bit of hay um, so that people could see them, but in general they're just kind of fending for themselves. And although this looks a little grim, this was in late fall. Um, this is a different picture of same the same herd in a much more lush time of year, of course. And you might be thinking, especially if you know something about ponies, you might already be thinking like, oh god, so they're just left out there and they just eat all of this. <laughs> It turns out that this is so interesting to me because they're left to their own devices and they spend most of their time moving, i.e. grazing. So they eat a little and move, eat a little, move, eat a little, move. Um, none of these horses have any lameness problems, laminitis, colic, uh, reproductive. They don't really have any issues. Um, Although if they're ever taken out of the herd and adopted and then kind of kept in a domestic situation, they often do develop those problems. So that I think that points a little bit to the idea that um, it's not that these particular ponies are just genetically gifted, right? It's 
something to do with the way we manage them. And so I think that's super interesting. Um, yeah, exactly. Someone said kind of like the Shinkatig ponies. Yes, it's very similar to that. And they do fine. Um, they're, of course, not immune to, for example, predation or weather, but um, they're a kind of a research herd. So this is kind of what I like to think about when I think of what what would pony do, right? <laughs> what would this horse do if they were left to their own devices? And I think it's important to remember that grazing is really quite good for them. Although we'll talk about shortly some reasons why that can be really difficult to offer sometimes. And then I mentioned this earlier, but I just wanted to clarify, um, probably everyone has, uh, if not heard of it, maybe even done it themselves, but if not, just a review. Especially in the US, we usually use the one to nine body condition score, so the Henneke score. Um, I like to call this or how to tell if your horse is fat. In theory, you're aiming for a five, and this is a, a nice little image here. And you can, if you can just Google equine BCS or horse body condition score or anything along those lines, you'll find all of these right away, but we can also send them to you if you're interested. This is a decent one because it's pretty straightforward and simple, but I actually prefer, especially if you're like really worried about a horse, so you're monitoring it over time while you're changing its diet, maybe. I think <clears throat> a really good way to go about it is to use a more localized measurement. So you have you're looking at each, so this goes one to nine, right? But then you're looking at each area. So you're looking at the neck and then the withers, loin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it gives you a little guide as to where exactly are you looking on this horse. And it shows you where to look. And then for each of them, you can read a very specific description and decide, okay, is the neck not obviously thin, but uh, blends smoothly into the body or is it, you know, and you can kind of really pinpoint. And then the idea is you can kind of add up all of what you have and take an average across those. And that'll give you not only a much finer measurement, um, but also I think it's a lot easier than if you, let's say you're doing it every month to check on a horse's weight change or something like that, in addition to probably taping them uh, to, to take their weight. Um, then I think you can, you'll get a lot more detail. You can kind of write down what it was. And then if it's certain areas changing faster than another, you can be like, oh, okay, maybe they really are losing some weight. The other reason I think this is nice is because I'm sure all of you uh, who've ever used a weight tape know that, first of all, the variation is a little uh, frustrating sometimes, right? So if you're only doing it like every two or four weeks, you try to do it exactly where you did before, but maybe you're not. And so you're always worried about it being a little off, but also horses with certain metabolic conditions, like we'll talk about in a minute, sometimes they have what's called regional adiposity, meaning parts of their body are quite fat and others kind of look normal. And you, maybe you've seen this, if you've seen some really fat horses, but this can help. So then sometimes you'll weight tape them and you'll be like, looks like they're okay. I, this seems fine, <laughs> right? But then you do the this kind of regional body condition score and you can say, oh, they actually have huge fat deposits. I didn't even think to like specifically just look at the tail head or something, right? So um, for me, I think this is a nice way, but if you, know, if you don't have time or you have a huge herd to deal with or whatever, this is also a great measurement just to kind of quickly be like, pick out the threes and sevens kind of, right? And make sure that you can get them a little closer to the middle. <clears throat> um, okay, we have a question. Old horses that lose body condition, dent yeah, dentition, that's a really hard one. Um, yes, uh, we'll, uh, do, I don't touch a lot on thin horses, but um, if I haven't mentioned anything of use to you by the end, then then let's talk because I don't think I got a, yeah. Um, but yeah, let me know if you still have a question at the end of the talk for sure. So, uh, still on the fat horse train here, um, keep going on that for a little bit. So a, a common question is like, I see this in the feed store. Do I need to buy a low starch diet? What is that? Who, who's buying these? Um, the main target audience here is overweight and obese horses. So greater than six out of nine, so six, seven, eight, nine, basically. Um, so, oh, you know, about half of horses in theory should be on this, right? And the thing, the reason we're, um, you know, pushing for that is that a common problem in these horses is insulin resistance. 
even if it's not diagnosed, you haven't done the blood work, whatever, you are worried about it. And so it's something for sure to, to look for, or at least maybe presumptively treat just by kind of feeding them an appropriate diet. Um, of course, you're worried about equine metabolic syndrome. If you're wondering what regional adiposity is, this is a pretty good example. That's one of the more extreme examples I've seen. Um, and then a lesser, uh, you know, not quite as common, but uh, of course, concerning issue is some of the, the myopathy. So the polysaccharide storage myopathy, you might have heard of PSSM, and then um, kind of subvariants as well, mo mostly in draft horses, right? These are the horses that kind of need or would likely benefit from some of these lower starch or lower sugar diets. Um, equine metabolic syndrome in particular uh, is unfortunately quite prevalent. So if your horse is a bit overweight, it's uh, unfortunately likely that your horse has this. And this is just a picture demonstrating nicely this little uh, fat pad on the crest that is very indicative of this issue. It's highly associated. So how to characterize it? Um, they're generally obese, so they can be overall fat and or have this regional adiposity I'm talking about. So maybe they just have fat deposits in certain regions. Um, and then of course, unfortunately, a common uh, associated problem is laminitis. So it could be that they just chronically have laminitis, maybe bouts or kind of are, are often lame from laminitis or maybe just an acute episode. And then you can start worrying, does my horse have EMS maybe? And then uh, one of the main ways to kind of diagnose or characterize EMS is some blood work, basically. So your vet can help you with this. Um, it's, it's essentially your, the blood glucose is normal, the sugar in the blood's normal, but you have way too much insulin. And so this is, means that you have insulin resistance. So it's basically not working. It's not lowering your blood sugar like it should. Um, that's insulin resistance. So that's, that's part of EMS. Um, Unfortunately, uh, probably a lot of you already know or have some of these breeds, right? But um, not to say they all get it. They're just a bit more predisposed. So ponies, of course, are the classic. And then some others as well. I didn't know actually some of these until I did some research on it. Um, Morgans, at least in our Northeast, are quite common, right? We have to worry about it with them. And of course, quarter horses are incredibly common as well. So any breed can get it. These are just a bit more commonly affected and might be predisposed. So if you are worried, you can, of course, get some blood work done or kind of preemptively start with an appropriate diet. Um, a big piece of it, thankfully, is doable, I would say. So managing their diet and then, of course, exercise as well, assuming they don't have laminitis. You don't want to be lunging a horse with laminitis, right? Um, so the big thing here is mostly just carbohydrate restriction, and that's what those diets are for. Um, what you're mostly worried about, I'm not going to get into a whole forage analysis, feed analysis thing with math and stuff, but in general, what you're looking at is the non-structural carbohydrates, so NSCs, um, and your vet can kind of help you pinpoint what's an appropriate level, like how bad is my case, um, was she diagnosed with in insulin resistance? If so, what level of NSC should I be aiming for? So that can vary a bit, but that's like the piece you're interested in for the most part, both for your feed, like your concentrates you're buying and uh, your hay actually. So it's good to get your hay tested. Um, and these are some kind of guidelines. Ideally, it would be great if it were less than 10% um, of the hay by dry matter, but uh, at least not over 16, that would be quite high. Some of you guys might have heard of soaking your hair, maybe you already do. Um, the idea here, so it's not, one reason you might soak your hair is for heaves or breathing stuff. That's a separate thing, right? That's just kind of getting it wet. This means soaking it like full to the top and soaking the entire thing for maybe 30 up to at most, maybe about 60 minutes. The idea is that you're kind of soaking out the some of those carbs, the ones you don't want. The problem is, it's not a bad idea. It's just that um, they've done some studies. It turns out you can't reliably know how much of it you're soaking out. So you, maybe you're doing a great job and in fact, you just rinsed a bunch out or maybe this hay is really holding on to it. You barely got rid of any. So then you're kind of in the dark, right? About what exactly are you feeding ultimately? So it's not that it's bad. It's just that you're not quite sure then what you're feeding, right? So it could help or it could maybe not help as much. And then another thing to keep in mind is that um, 
if you soak it for too long, you really wouldn't want to go over an hour because actually pretty quickly you can start to get um, bacterial populations getting a little bit out of hand. So microbes really love wet hay water, it turns out. So you don't want to be feeding that um, if it's been soaking for any longer than that. So, and it's a pain, especially in the winter, right? I, it, it's just not, it's not what you want to spend your time doing. So um, it's not that it's a bad idea. It's just that there are some caveats, right? Um, oh, thank you very much, Abby. And let's see. Yes. And we can send resources out later too, if, and put in the chat for sure, if there's something you missed that you want us to send out. Um, oh, and then, uh, a lot of barns probably have a tub of this somewhere, right? Um, uh, thyro L or levothyroxine, it can help accelerate weight loss short term. Um, that's more like, we're really worried about this horse. We need to start cutting some weight off because this is not a good situation. Otherwise it's not, um, a huge help. It's much more sustainable to do the dietary management and exercise. But if this is like not a good situation, sometimes a vet will choose to also prescribe some thyro -L. And then you might work with your vet and they, maybe they're suggesting metformin also that can have some impacts on some of these endocrine measures as well. And so that might be why they mentioned that. Um, unfortunately, for some of these treatments, the long-term efficacy and even the safety aren't necessarily studied super well. So it's kind of a, a conversation with you and your vet. Um, what's safe? What's been researched? I think I want to try it anyways. You know, it's kind of a conversation like that. Um, so... EMS, it can be scary, but thankfully, I, once you get the program going and you kind of know what you're aiming for, thankfully, it's it's um, relatively straightforward after that, right? Um, oh, good question. So we have a question, can using a hay steamer do the same thing? Very good question. Excellent for heaves because it gets rid of the dust. Not as good for removing carbs because when you're soaking it, it's actually like rinsing it out kind of, does that make sense? So it's like left in, you're making like hay tea basically. And that's the tea that has the carbs left. The hay steamers are great, amazing for heaves or even just a normal horse and reducing the dust, not as good for the carb removal. That's a really good question, yeah. And then just briefly, uh, just to mention, because it's kind of in the same class in terms of like low sugar, low starch, right? Um, it's one of the causes of tying up. So tying up isn't really like a diagnosis. It's more like a, a clinical sign, something that you see, right? Um, PSSM is certainly one of them. You'll see, you know, the stiffness, cramping, they might sweat quite a bit. You're really reluctant to move, kind of stand like this. Um, the issue, these poor things, they can't uh, store or use sugar in their muscles very well. So a normal horse stores it just fine. Unfortunately, on the right here, you see a huge storage problem with sugar. So they can tell based on looking at a sample of their muscle, which is at least good news, right? That it's easy to diagnose. If you have more questions on this stuff, I'd recommend, obviously you'll have to do all this testing and stuff. So definitely talk to your vet. Maybe you've seen this, but didn't really know what to, what it meant or whatever that definitely worth bringing up to your vet and they'll send off. Um, you can either do genetic testing uh, especially maybe if you're considering breeding and or a muscle biopsy to diagnose your own horse. So um, thankfully, fairly straightforward to diagnose now. Um, and then the treatment actually, to be honest, is kind of similar. So you just, uh, you're trying to make sure they're getting uh, the correct number of calories. So you could use a grazing muzzle. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, again, same as EMS, low NSC hay, the non-structural carbs, and then uh, maybe instead of 2% body weight, which is kind of like a standard amount of hay to feed, a bit lower maybe, depending on the case. And then especially daily exercise, it turns out is uh, really, really helpful and important once you're on a program kind of. Um, again, selecting that low NSC hay. And for some of these horses, adding fat can be quite helpful, especially if they're not fat to begin with, right? And then I just wanted to give a shout out to you know, Matt Cornell. So um, there are tons of uh, equine diagnostic plans for all of these things. So um, insulin, leptin, ACTH, you know, a bunch of stuff for EMS, uh, the glucose, et cetera. And so you can work with your vet if you're, um, they, it's actually quite easy to send samples and get a quick diagnosis. 
Um, and then you can kind of start working on a plan. So we have all of that. All right. And then I mentioned thyroid. So some of you may either have had a horse with, you thought had thyroid disease, or maybe you've used this before or seen it. Um, it turns out horses actually, as opposed to a lot of other species, they very rarely have primary hypothyroidism. So it's not like the reason that their thyroid levels are different. It's not their thyroid, it turns out. So that's very rare in horses. Um, they can have it secondary to some stuff we've talked about though. EMS, equine metabolic syndrome can cause weird thyroid stuff basically. And then PPID or Cushing's, which I'll talk about in a second, can also cause kind of weird thyroid levels. So it's not that the thyroid has a problem. It's just that it's affected by these things. So if you have a horse with a metabolic problem, it may have affected the thyroid as well a bit. And again, tons of information from the HCC at Cornell. Um, and honestly, just Google, you know, HDC or Cornell diagnostic or something, and then whatever you're interested in. So there's some great info on thyroid testing. Um, how do we interpret it? All of that stuff. Um, we can share whatever anyone's interested in later on. If you, if I went a little too fast for that. Um, and then, uh, in general, let's say maybe whether, whatever they have, maybe they have EMS, maybe they don't, maybe they just got really fat this summer, whatever it is, if you have an obese horse, a lot of potential strategies. Um, the biggest thing, obviously, that we've talked about, you have to reduce intake and NSCs, ideally, because that's what's really contributing a lot to the fat, the increased weight, right? But the key is you don't want to compromise welfare. So we talked about like Sue McDonald's semi-feral pony herd. Um, we want to be as close to that as possible without, of course, you know, causing laminitis or something, right? So that's a fine and difficult uh, line to walk, right? So a clear <laughs> culprit sometimes is treats. Um, I'm a big, because I clicker train, I use a lot of treats. And I don't know what I would do without them, but you can find lower NSC treats, but at least um, reduce them quite a bit, use them sparingly, and or if it's a really severe case, eliminate them and reward with scratching or something, right? Um, concentrates, uh, a horse does not need green or concentrates to survive, especially if it's obese. It can generally survive on good forage, plus probably maybe a ration balancer, which is the equivalent of like a vitamin, right, for a horse. Um, so they really don't need it. They, they'll be sad at feed time if they're the only one, but the ration balancer gives them kind of a little consolation prize. Again, low NSC hay, you can soak it alternatively. Again, we talked about some caveats with that. You can use a slow feed system. So there are a lot, some are quite expensive. Some are just hay nets, right? <laughs> so you can find what works for you, what you can afford. Um, one option is always, if especially if it's quite bad, the horse just has uh, just had laminitis, we really need to be careful. You can put them on like a dry lot or sacrifice lot without much or any grass potentially, um, and then just provide the hay that you know is safe in kind of certain areas and uh, in a slow feeder maybe. And then grazing muzzles for sure are an option, um, especially if all you have for turnout or all you have available is just regular pastures with grass, this is a great option. Um, and I think a key thing to remember is that whenever possible, if you can allow grazing, even if it's altered, let's say by a muzzle or something, or um, maybe it's just spreading hay around a dry lot, um, it's really good for their welfare. So whenever you can, if you can do it safely, it's really good to do. And then this is, again, not, not if they have laminitis, right? <laughs> so don't work on a laminitic horse, but if they're sound, your vet clears it. It's honestly, you can just increase their workload, um, even if it's just uh, walking. Sometimes if it's more often, that can help quite a bit. Um, if you have the time uh, or someone you know has the time to ride them more, uh, any kind of work really um, can help quite a bit, just like in people. Like I said, be careful with laminitis, right? And just make sure it's real gradual. That's another thing your vet could help you with potentially is make a plan for that. And then as a, another caveat, <laughs> I wanted to mention, so another thing, grazing muzzles, you love them or hate them probably, right? Or maybe both at the same time. Um, they're really good tools. There are definitely some pros. Um, 
the biggest for me is that they can still be horses basically, right? They could be with their friends. They can still kind of do this grazing behavior. Um, there's not much, you're not soaking stuff and hauling stuff and moving hay and whatever. You're just kind of putting this on and then letting the horse go. This is assuming it doesn't break them every day. right? Um, and then also, thankfully, because most horses are used to halters, the muzzle is not a big leap. So they're not really scared of them or something. Right. So that's nice, of course. And then um, it often does help. So that's nice. Right. So it, it is effective in a lot of cases if it's used correctly. Um, as you might imagine, the cons are next. Unfortunately, um, there's a lot of variation in terms of how much it helps any given horse. It's hard to know without trying. Um, some get really good at eating through it and in my opinion are almost not affected at all by the presence of the muzzle. They just, they're very committed. Um, and then the other thing is that it's really hard to know how much you're actually reducing intake by. So it's not like you give them a flake that you weighed, right? Then you know this, you're just kind of hoping it reduces intake, but you're not technically sure how, except to just measure their weight, you know, every couple of weeks or something, right? So that's a little frustrating. The other thing is if the grass is long enough, it's very easy to eat through them. And so um, if it, then if it's too long, it's almost impossible to eat through them because it bends, right? So it's very affected by grass length. So that can be super variable as well and a little frustrating. And then, you know, the poor souls who've had horses in these know this all too well. Um, you might have to replace them quite frequently, if anything, just because the bottom gets rubbed, but also because they'll probably break them, right? Um, they get destroyed. Um, they might just be lost in the pasture, God knows how often, right? And I wanted to make a note, technically there is a minor safety concern, just like if you had a halter on, right? Um, they could technically get caught up in something. So, you know, always have that in the back of your mind, check your fences, all that. And the key with grazing muzzles, if you use one, just remember this, hopefully, uh, it does have to be on whenever they're out. And a big thing that people don't do is they say, I'll just have it on for like a few hours and then take it off so he can graze regularly. They've done studies that show that there's a rebound effect. So once you remove it, they actually increase their consumption way beyond normal until they get, they're like, okay, now I'm good. And then they'll go back to normal. So there's, then you're really not doing anything, right? And so um, if you take it off, cause, oh, he was good. He had it on for a couple hours, sadly, it doesn't work that way. I, I wish it did too, but um, any thoughts or questions? It looks like we have a, yes, yeah, some are much more durable than others. And that's a good uh, note. And also there are so many different designs. Sometimes one might not work for your horse and you can try another. So maybe don't give up after the first one or two brands you try. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm with you in solidarity. <clears throat> I spent almost all the time on fat horses, didn't I? I said I would, I guess, but <laughs> I just want to touch on a couple more things before we have open up for questions. Um, of course, PPID I had to touch on Cushing's. This is the classic horse, right? PPID, um, it just means they have a little tiny benign tumor in part of their brain, but it has a huge effects, right? So lots of hormones are affected, but the one we're mostly worried about is cortisol, like the stress hormone, right? Um, and unfortunately it's actually, uh, if your horse has EMS, they're at increased risk of PPID. So it's often, especially in older horses, they'll go hand in hand, unfortunately. Um, although it's not always, your horse can have Cushing's and have no problems with insulin resistance. So it doesn't go the other way. It is usually older horses. Um, most are older than 15, although it can be any age, really. The main things to look for, it's really in the spring, right about now, a month from now, if your horse is really not shedding out, he's still incredibly hairy. That's always like the red flag to test them, right? Um, sometimes it's even curly um, and it just won't shed out as quickly. And unfortunately, because cortisol so increased, that stress hormone, that makes them more susceptible to infections. So maybe all you see is that your horse um, keeps uh, getting infections or keeps getting hoof abscesses. Sometimes the cause is PPID, their cortisol is so high that they're just very susceptible to this. So that's always something to keep in the back of your mind. It could just be very lethargic. A classic one is losing a lot of muscle mass. People will be like, the top line's just like leaving quickly. What's, I'm still working. I'm, sometimes is that they have Cushing's. 
Good news though, very easy to treat. Of course, there's a cost, but it's easy. So you can give them some low carb depending on the case, but you just give them a pill a day, more or less, uh, of pergolide. So thank, thankfully, it is easy to treat. And then I think we'll flow past uh, this because <laughs> let's, let's get, uh, I want to have some time for discussion here, but I just wanted to mention quickly um, gastric ulcer syndrome because I said I would. This was upsetting to me when I learned this originally. It's incredibly common. Um, and in fact, most adult horses do have some degree of gastric ulcer syndrome, which is of course sad. Um, so to diagnose it, of course you can, they're all the classic uh, things people worry about. So they'll say, oh, he's just not eating his grain as well. They seems kind of dull. His attitude has changed in any direction kind of, right? Um, maybe they're not performing as well. The body weight's low. Maybe their girthiness, um, low grade colic. These are all fine to look out for, and you should anyways, I guess, right? But the, the only definitive diagnosis is gastroscopy. So they sedate the horse, they put a long tube with a little camera on the end down the nose and through uh, the esophagus into the stomach, and they just look around at it. Um, this is a really severe case. So hopefully no one no one owns horse, no one's own horse has a case this bad, but it should look like this. Um, and then to treat and prevent actually a lot of very similar things to uh, some other, you know, feeding issues, right? So you want fresh food available day and night. So you want forage around 24 seven, if possible. Um, you want to reduce the number of concentrates to the lowest amount possible, because that can cause uh, ulceration. For sure, avoid pain because any kind of increased stress or pain can predispose them to ulcers. Um, so decrease stress again, for example, trailering or going to a show, you always want to preventatively treat. And then definitely think about NSAIDs. So like, you know, ibuprofen for us or banamine or bute for them. Um, make sure that's uh, generally only short term. And if it's longer term, um, you're, you'll have to work with your vet to, for example, give GastroGuard, which is the only... Um, approved treatment for gastric ulcers. There are a lot of other questionable uh, kind of off-market treatments, but the only definitive treatment for gastric ulcers is a, a round of GastroGuard, which unfortunately, yes, is very expensive. And I've felt that pain myself. So I sympathize with you guys. Um, I guess we can, it's quite uh, getting close to the end there. I said, it's, I'm fine if we don't finish all the slides. Was there anything in particular people saw from that early list that they really were hoping I would get to and we haven't yet. Um, so we have hindgut imbalance, which I can get through. I think there was some stuff on um, hay nets and uh, round bales, stuff like that. Uh, Debbie, in general, yes. Although if the area the horse is grazing doesn't have uh, much grass, it doesn't need it on. If it's inside, obviously it doesn't need it on. Um, it's really just if you're worried that the house could, the house, <laughs> the horse could eat uh, quite a bit of like lush grass. That's when you, you can't just leave it on for a couple hours and then take it off because he'll just make up for that lost time. Basically, it, it, hopefully that's what you're asking. Hay nets and hay nets. Okay. I say, I see a few for that. So let's, um, woo. <laughs> so I didn't have a ton of, um, uh, you know, really interesting new comments on this, but the the reasons people give for using them are, of course, to reduce the speed at which a horse eats its forage, right? Um, it also reduces waste um, and kind of keeps the stall a bit cleaner. There's not a bunch that they're trampling on and there's manure everywhere, right? So it's a cost saver for sure. The size of the holes definitely influences how quickly they can eat. Sometimes this doesn't slow them down much at all, right? Whereas a really small one would. Um, there are some other kind of products like this hay pillow thing. A concern here is that if your horse has shoes, of course, you wouldn't want this there because it could get caught on the shoes. Um, but at least this does allow for that eating off the ground uh, effect, which worries some people. Um, that is a more natural position. Again, like I said, there's not a ton of data on how important exactly that is for them. I will say there is some research on um, the effect of hay nets on respiratory health. That's not really what we're talking about today, but it's relevant, I guess, to your questions. Um, there's been some research to show that if 
you use a hangnet, the, it may exacerbate some respiratory problems because it turns out they, the horse tends to kind of like keep its nose kind of smashed into the hay net. Whereas if they're eating off the ground, apparently they get a little bit of more of a breather from having their face completely in the hay. And so if their face is just smashed into the hay net, they're inhaling a lot of dust and whatever's in the hay really, right? Probably little mold particles, no matter how good the hay is. Um, and so in, if you have a really heavy horse or a uh, you're worried about some respiratory issues with your horse. Um, it could be argued that maybe that would be one vote against using a hay net. Um, and then using these guys, I, I corner feeders, hay corner feeder. I've heard a few different names for them. I have heard, this is so rare, but I've personally encountered cases where horses have gotten their feet stuck in them. It, you'd have to have a very exuberant horse, but there that is. So I guess that's one potential thing to think about. Um, let's see supplements. Sure. Yeah. And I, guys, you can, uh, head out. I know it's quite late. I'll just try to get to the questions that have been put in the chat here. Um, supplements. Ooh. So the, the short version, the short <laughs> answer is that most horses are fine. Um, on forage, good forage that you've tested and cleared with your vet and some kind of ration balancer to replace anything they're missing. Some key caveats are if you live in an area that's low in certain things, for example, vitamin E selenium, like we are here, you might need to supplement that. There are a lot of other examples of like regional things you might need to supplement. Um, but thankfully for most cases, not all cases, for most cases, you can test for these things. Often it's an easy blood test and you can just say, is my horse low in magnesium? I don't know. I heard this was a thing. I'm worried about it. I, my horse has some of these clinical signs that could be associated with low magnesium. You can just, your vet can just draw some blood and test it. And if they are low, you can supplement. If they're not great, you're not, you know, kind of spending money on a supplement, right? The other thing I want to make a big, you know, <laughs> kind of a pet peeve of mine, I guess you could say, is that, um, a lot of supplements uh, are not backed by much research, and even those that are and who are very well-meaning and did all the work and are probably great companies, they're still not regulated, right? So it's um, you're kind of just putting a lot of trust in whoever made the supplement because they're not regulated, for example, by the FDA, right? And so... Um, it's easy to make claims. And like I said, some probably are, have done the research and maybe they're quite good claims uh, or evidence-based, I guess you could say, and others aren't. But at the end of the day, you're kind of just trusting them that what they said is in there is in fact in there. Um, there have been plenty of studies analyzing what's in supplements to show that it rarely matches up very well, um, except in a few cases. So I guess I can stop sharing my screen, can I? Because I'm not referring to that anymore. Um, that was a really quick overview of supplements. Did I miss stuff? Let's see. What blood test should be obtained as a baseline when evaluating an obese draft pony? Yeah, so talk to your vet, but they'll probably draw, um, actually something I showed on that uh, earlier slide, they'll probably do maybe an ACTH, insulin glucose. It's kind of like a metabolic panel. That's something that's pretty common to draw and then send to Cornell, and then you'll kind of get a picture of how bad is this? What kind of diet plan do we need? Do I need to immediately put them on a dry lot or is this something we can kind of slowly do? Um, that's often a starting place. Um, yeah, Karen, go ahead. So she, she has um, some thoughts on low NSC hay, which as she probably knows, not everyone makes. <laughs> so. Oh, I don't know about that. No, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to add that, um, 16 years ago, my 34 year old horse developed Cushing's. And of course we were doing our own hay. So I heard, you know, about low NSC hay. So I did an experiment on my hay fields and we mowed at different times and then yeah. and I sent it all in for analysis. And I also did the same with my pastures. So on my property, um, if we mow after 11 o'clock, the NSC starts to shoot right up. So yep. 
when I was selling some hay to for racehorses, we did some that we didn't care what time we mowed it. Right. <laughs> and they need the energy, right? <laughs> You know, yeah. now I'm not doing that. So my hay is all low NSC. I won't. And it's a pain in the neck. It's harder to get it dry when you mow early like that. You know, the dew is still on it and it, it is a pain to get it dry. But in the long run, you know, you're better off. And now, again, I have a horse with Cushing's and I have two that I have to have tested for EMS because I'm highly mm-hmm. suspicious that they have it. Yeah. So, um you know, I don't I don't worry about it. But one of the things that I learned, because I live in a, a town that I'm surrounded by dairy farms, is the dairy farmers mow late in the afternoon because they want the sugar in the hay for the milk. Mm-hmm. So if you're buying your hay from a dairy farmer and you've got a horse with EMS or Cushing's, you really need to have that hay analyzed. Yes. Because chances are it's going to be high in NSC. Yes, absolutely. Completely agree with you. And so, and a lot of you or some of you probably know that the reason it's like that is because, you know, they're photosynthesizing. So they're making more and more and more sugar. And then overnight they use it. And so that's why she mows in the morning, because that's when they've used it all up. They haven't had time to make any more yet. Um, but it, like she said, that's real hard with the dry matter. So I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you do a lot of tedding, a lot of tedding <laughs> yeah. over and over and over and over, like twice like a day. Like it's a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it works. I mean, it does work. So I, you know, I have my hay analyzed every year. I, and I use Equa Analytica, which is down near you by Cornell. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah that's yeah. who I use. And I, a little plug, they'll probably talk about this next month, but uh, most CCE offices have, or at least have access to a hay corer and can help you guys test your hay if you're not sure where to get started with that. Yeah, ours do, in Madison County Cornell Cooperative Extension does. Yeah. Um, and I, ha- I have my own to, and I lend it to people oh. in town here. She said but, it here, guys. <laughs> if that's where you are. <laughs> Thank you for letting me say my piece. Oh, yeah. Thanks for making low MSC hay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so anyone who's uh, heard everything they wanted to hear, feel free to head out. And I think, uh, I can't remember the date of our next one, May 11th? Yep, Wednesday, May 11th, we'll have Ken Estes, um, who is another member of the equine subgroup that we'll be talking about pasture management. So feel free to join us next month. And thank you, Lindsay, for sharing with us tonight. And thank you everyone for sharing your evening with us. Thanks guys, good to see you.